Uh, Walter, uh, Walter Kosha. Some of you know him very well. I've known Walter ever since I uh, graduated from my medical oncology training. Have interacted with him um, in the field of uh, well, originally in GI. What's not known is he actually treated lung cancer and regular colon cancer before he concentrated on neuroendocrine. But right now his uh, practice is mainly in the neuroendocrine field, and that's where his research interests are. Um, he's a, he is a, uh, a, a university professor at, uh, at London, Ontario, and that's where he's currently practicing. And his talk is Guidelines for Nets, the Rise and Limitations, and I already threatened him saying, don't screw it up, because I'm supposed to present the Canadian guidelines, of which I may add, Walter, you're the primary author of the paper. Um, you are. Yeah, remember the proofs? Yes. Um, anyways, uh, and the Rise and Limitations, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Walter? Thank you. Um, um, thanks to the introduction, uh, I know I had to pay you quite a bit to make it sound good, so um, yeah. checks in the mail. There were the guidelines for NETS, and, and the reason I, I got interested in this topic is not only that we were involved in, in guidelines for Canada, but I've often heard it, uh, um, the sentiment expressed here, uh, especially from patients that, gee, all we need is guidelines and then other physicians and my physician can, uh, can, take, can take care of it. I don't think it's that easy. Well, what is a guideline? Uh, a dictionary or a uh, encyclopedic um, indication is that it is a statement or other indication of policy or procedure by which to determine a course of uh, action but they are generally not standards or policies in themselves. They can and occasionally do uh, recommend some policy or procedure become a standard, but they are not standards in, them, in themselves, and, and, and there's a very important reasons why this, is, uh, why this is so. Well, the guidelines came about um, really since uh, the early 2000s, and over the years, there's been a whole lot of them. The first ones off the block was the ENETS um, with their consensus guidelines in 2004, which they updated in 2009. And there you can see a listing of the other guidelines uh, that, that have come about and, ex and existed. And you can see the Canadian consensus guidelines, 2006, um, and now 2009. And I can say I, uh, I chaired that group. We actually started in 2008. We submitted it for publication in late May of 2009, and now one year later, they're finally going to be published by the journal in June of this year. It took a whole year after submission to get that, uh, to, to get that published. Um, you saw an example of the NCCN guidelines. There's a uh, near the guidelines of the Polish network. Um, there's one from experts of Latin America. European Society of Medical Oncology, more ENETS guidelines, and they're currently now starting the next guideline uh, cycle, and most recently the NANETS, the North American Urine Consumer Society guidelines. Well, how do these get made? Well, the contributors tend to be one of two groups, although they very much overlap. They're ad hoc expert groups or organizations. And if you saw those list of all those guidelines, I saw there's at least 13 of them out, uh, out now, um, a lot of those guidelines consisted, uh, were made by groups that consisted of people that were in a lot of those guidelines. There was an awful lot of, uh, awful lot of overlap. Um, their scope can vary. They can be limited diagnosis, as one of the guidelines is, to management, or they can be both. The disease inclusivity can be just for carcinoid or other subsets of neuroendocrine tumors or all of neuroendocrine tumors. It depends on the guideline. The organization of the guidelines can be different. They can be listed by individual disease entities. They can be listed um, by extent of disease or they can go off treatment modalities. They can list the treatment modalities and where they're useful. So the organizations vary from um, guideline to guideline, and the format may be a narrative, um, a, a long narrative about various treatments, 
or they can be algorithmic. And you saw in one of those last talks, the NCCN guideline, well, that was uh, sorry, algorithmic um, brief statements and lines indicating where decisions should go, or they can be both in a, a guideline. Um, the levels of details can include a very lengthy, comprehensive literature review, so just mainly a listing and some considerations of recommendations. They can, they can vary quite considerably, but they're mostly identical in content. If you look at them closely, most of them are, are, are pretty well the same in terms of what they're recommending where and when. There are some differences, and the differences can be in the scope and selection of disease subsets, as I indicated before. Um, they may reflect any particular groups, countries, or organizations' availability of treatment modalities. Um, um, but we, we deal with, um, with radioisotope therapy uh, and mention it uh, quite considerably. That there's, there's other guidelines that hardly mention that at all. Uh, in Sweden, they do a lot of interferon, so that's very high up, and it's much lower in the list in, uh, in North America, but they are generally, generally listed nonetheless. And they often reflect the abilities and preferences of the uh, contributors, because Oberg likes interferon. That's very highly uh, reflected in the guidelines from, uh, from, from Europe, and it's different in other guidelines in terms of the order in which they are, these things are considered. However, these guidelines do have limitations, as fantastic as they may seem for, a, uh, uh, for, the, for the whole neuroendocrine tumor treatment system, they do have their limitations. One of the major ones, and the major, major ones that's occurred now, and you've heard reference to this earlier in this conference, is there's a real problem of differences in pathological classifications. And at the beginning of the year, the AGCC released uh, their new uh, classifications, um, there was an indication by several different speakers that there was a meeting between the um, groups from the WHO, UICC, and the North Americans, and they underwent a Delphi uh, process to come up with a common pathological classification, and they failed, and they, uh, uh, there appeared to be a considerable um, uh, difference in certain areas, in particular without doing KI-67s. It appears that the Americans don't uniformly do KI-67s, and therefore, don't want to do them and are finding reasons why they shouldn't do them, the rest of us uh, very much hang our hats for management on this. And uh, when this has come out and our pathologist said, well, we, we, we follow the AGCC um, uh, pathology, uh, I've indicated to them in the most strongest terms, well, you better include all the data there, but it's where we're going to drive the WHO techniques because that's what we use for treatment. We don't, uh, we're not going to go by AGCC. So that's our recent and major problem that we are hopefully will be working itself out uh, somewhere in the near to middle term future. There's a time lag in these things. Remember I said that we started uh, the revision in 2008 and it's only now in 2010 which we can actually uh, re reveal it. You know, 18 months later, that's, that's, that's a significant time lag when there's major changes or differences in the field to make that, that's available. And I think for, based on our experience, we're probably not going to be using the journal method for releasing those guidelines um, in the future. We'll probably still use journals to write about them and refer to them, but I think we have to find other ways of getting that out in a timely fashion. There's problems of distribution and availability because it's such a multidisciplinary um, consideration of, of NETS guidelines and such a very diverse group of, uh, of uh, specialists to deal with it. Uh, there is really not one good journal in which we can reach all of these people with. We generally are going to have to write articles in various different specialties and point to our guidelines. So there's considerable problems of distribution and having them available and having people know that they, uh, that they exist. Generally, these cannot include research and ongoing trials, and they usually do not delineate the controversial or contentious issues you know, in, in most of these guidelines. Sometimes they do a lot of time. They, 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 they do not. They cannot represent the complexities of individual uh, patients, and that's why in the text of these, you will often see, if this, then consider. They won't say, if this, then do this. They'll say, if this, then consider this. And that is because treatment decisions in patients 
are very complex things. They're interfered by all sorts of things. It is impossible to come up with a document that tell, what, would tell you what to do. In all occasions, it would be several thousand pages. Nobody would have the ability to do it, and we probably would not do a very good job of, of making that sort of thing um, in any case. Now, the place where this is probably most useful are those uh, in who don't have much knowledge or experience in it, but yet it turns out to be difficult to use uh, without experience. Um, physicians not dealing with this group of tumors, including oncologists, will, will, even they will have difficulty using this, and that's because there's behavioral differences of this tumor that they often do not appreciate. Uh, they, they, they do not... Um, uh, do not behave like other, other tumors, and you don't realize that until you've been in the field for a considerable times, a period of time, and you get to appreciate how be, differently they, be, uh, they behave. Now, the thing about this is the uh, whole uh, conception of expert, and that's one of the things I wish to, uh, to touch on, and that is that um, it is experts that can use this best. Now, um, you might think that the definition and conception of an expert is something that older physicians like myself utilize and conceive of so we can control the young Turks that are coming up and it's very ad hoc. Well, it isn't because there's a very large literature on expertise. Um, the, the, the best uh, reference I now see to it is, is a book, uh, is the Cambridge Handbook of Expertise, which summarizes all the papers, research and methodologies and expertise Published in 2006, it's over 900 pages long, and it has um, many hundreds of references. They didn't number it, so I can't give you an exact number, but there's many hundreds of references in it. It reflects a very large body of research, mainly from the psychosocial uh, uh, academic um, groups, and they cover various many of domains, and by domains I see, I mean, uh, well, it covers chess playing uh, as a domain, and playing an instrument is a domain, and being a physician is a domain. It can get more specific than that because dealing with neuronic tumors is a domain, which I believe I have expertise on, but I don't have expertise on dealing with cardiac disease. That's a different domain. Expertise is very, uh, very domain specific. And uh, there is a number of considerations of, uh, of experts. Um, one of them is that it is found that when you look at how experts deal with information, and specifically in the medical field, this has been done very formally in various places, especially McGill, looking at how physicians come up with diagnosis and how well do they do with giving accurate diagnosis. Novices in the field reason rather differently. They reason from uh, what's called backward reasoning, which means they often need the rules, such, such as we would put in the guidelines, but as you get expertise in this, you one, perform better, and you use forward reasoning. And, and rules or guidelines don't actually, um, don't, don't, don't actually occur in, in, um, in, in that form of reasoning. Um, to try to illustrate this, uh, I know that a number of you are going to be at home in the next day or two. Some of you are going to get on an airplane. How would you feel about getting on an airplane when, you were, when it's announced? Well, your pilot's actually never flown a plane before, but he read the guidelines last night. And uh, your teenager, your 15-year-old teenager says, uh, Mom, Dad, I've, I've read the guidelines on the car. Please give me the keys. So long. I don't think you'd, uh, you'd buy, buy into that. Um, the, the, a lot of what's in the guidelines... Wrong button. Uh, what's, a lot of what's in the guidelines is... is it's not one of, a lot of the guidelines is knowledge, and, and knowledge is not enough. And, and again, as an illustration of this, there, there, there was the, uh, the story of some 20 to 30 years ago at the uh, U.S. and Marine Naval Station in Pensacola, Florida, which was the major place where they trained um, um, pilots. Uh, they had a candidate who was just fantastic. He got perfect in every exam. They never had anybody in the ground school like him. He was absolutely perfect, and they had great hopes for him as a pilot. The first time he got into a jet trainer, he immediately withdrew the landing gear and deposited the aircraft to, with a, as a very expensive mess on the ground. He washed out immediately. The knowledge wasn't enough. There's other skills and competencies you have to do and judgments you have to be able to make in order to use your knowledge. And 
Guidelines can also be subject to abuse or inappropriate use. This especially occurs by funders. Gee, the guideline isn't there, or this doesn't actually fit your criteria, so no, we're not going to pay for it. By, uh, by governments, well, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll fund that, but you have to have a guideline for it. Well, golly, it can take a year or more to get that guideline out there, and the patients who are caught in the middle don't get therapy that can be otherwise very uh, useful for it. And there are some physicians unaware of their lack of knowledge or are confident in their abilities in areas they haven't previously dealt with. You know, I've dealt with something like that before, so I can deal with that. Um, and, and they do not do well with this. The good physician recognizes, gee, this is sort of outside of my area. I'd better send them to somebody who knows what they're doing. And there are a lot of those physicians around, and unfortunately there's a number of those other physicians around who are quite confident they can, they can handle this, especially with the, with the guidelines, uh, and, and, and they can't. Guidelines, as I said, provide mainly knowledge, um, but practitioners need the skills and competencies I've alluded to before. Um, but how much experience? How do you get this expertise? And the research indicates, well, you need to see, you need to do a lot of it. Uh, and there are is, there is definitions, especially in the European community, which uh, indicates in order to have expertise and continue to have expertise, you need to see something to the order of 50 to 80 new patients a year. Um, most oncologists, by the way, if they see all sorts of uh, tumors, will see two to three new ones a year. And you have to follow patients of at least 200 per year, and I believe more are being, are, are being suggested. Uh, it's not only that you need to see that and you're immediately an expert, you need a time of experience and how much experience. Well, um, some of you may have read a very popular book by Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, and in one of those chapters, he will indicate that it's probably around 10 years or 10,000 hours of experience, and when you look at that rate of seeing patients, that's about 10 years of experience. Now, Malcolm Gladwell did not come up with, by that, with that by himself. He got this from the research letter I have alluded to previously, uh, and it's probably Erickson who's been the major uh, proponent of that. Doesn't seem to matter what it is. Chess master, uh, master um, um, a musician, uh, whatever domain, uh, it takes about 10 years of experience and 10,000 hours of committed uh, work in that. You can't do this passively, just sitting back and watching. You really actively have to be actively engaged. It doesn't work in, in, a, passive, in a passive way. Um, multidisciplinary evaluation and management. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I, I can indicate that, again, expertise is something and that most of us find we don't need those guidelines because it's become very internalized to us. You know, um, when you get up in the morning, you probably don't refer to any guidelines to figure out how to get dressed. You've been doing this a long time and, and you do it yourself and you probably don't refer to the guidelines before you're in the car to know how to utilize the car. You've, you've internalized that. You don't need uh, the guidelines. Um, uh, I can say, however, that I, I actually held, I have a, um, uh, a multidisciplinary conference about that because the fashion sense is completely out of my domain of expertise. So it usually goes like, like honey, what should I wear today? Um, you, do, you still need that multidisciplinary uh, sort of uh, conference. So you need a multidisciplinary clinics or at least a tumor board, which is multidisciplinary. And you've heard this message before, and I can only underscore it from the data that we have, that all patients should have benefited an evaluation at a center of expertise. And guidelines by themselves are, are not enough. In fact, their limitations are limited and their potential for abuse are, are considerable. Thank you very much.